Hello and welcome to the video lecture on sentences. So sentences have some basic structures. Most commonly you're going to see noun, verb, and object, or noun, verb, or just a verb. And noun, verb, object, Donald, the subject is the noun, hit is the verb, and Sam is the object, the recipient of the action of the verb. Um, in the case of a transitive verb. Or if it's just a noun and verb, Sam cried, or just a verb stop is an imperative. It's got the understood you. And these are some pretty basic structures that you're going to be seeing a lot. And if we're looking at it simply like this with just one, two, or three word sentences, it's pretty clear what's what, what's doing what, which word has which job in the sentence. This is not confusing at all. It becomes a problem not when we look at it like this, as it often appears in a grammar book, but when we look at something like this, the preamble to the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So what exactly is the main part of this sentence? What's the noun and verb, that subject and verb uh, structure here? Well. It's this, we do ordain and establish this constitution. That follows the subject, verb, and object formula. But there's all this other stuff that's going on here. We're talking about sentences, specifically how to write your own good sentences. And so do we need to talk about clauses, parts of speech, the function of different words, and clauses functioning as words or parts of speech, uh, structure class and form class words, and all these things that Honestly, I'm not qualified to even teach you, but that fall into uh, a linguist's territory. And the answer is unequivocally no, we, we don't, which is great news because wanting to write good sentences shouldn't have to be a lifelong endeavor just to start to get the basics down. It's sort of like being a, a healthful person versus going to medical school. If you go to medical school, you'll learn all about the body, about how everything works and everything's job and about medicines and, and maintaining the body, and that's great. But you don't have to do that in order to eat right and exercise. That knowledge does give you control, yes, and, and control can help you understand exceptions to rules that will allow you to, to write better sentences or perhaps to, to be a better editor or to review your sentences uh, in a better way, but that doesn't mean that you have to know all of that in order to have healthful sentences, to have good sentences. So instead of looking at, at all the rules, we're gonna look at principles instead. And our principles are economy, accuracy, moving from the known to the unknown, and then variance at the end, which is really more of a rule for paragraphs, but it's going to affect our sentences. Let's start by looking at economy. This is a paragraph from the website aimstrategies.com. It's written by their VT data analysis team, and the purpose is to set up a book that they're trying to sell, um, or were trying to sell back in 2010, and I found this by Googling just educational blogs, and then I followed a series of links and got here. But this is a quote from their introduction on their webpage. Walk into any office today, and you know that things are not as they were a decade ago. Ask employees about their co-workers, and many will say they are working on projects with colleagues in a different building, a different city, or even a different country. The business landscape has changed as globalization and technology have reshaped the way we conceptualize teamwork and conduct business. There are substantial changes in how teams are structured across the globe, and therefore organizations must identify challenges inherent in leading a virtual workforce, and then devise appropriate strategies to meet them. Overall, I don't think this is a, a terrible paragraph. It's, it's pretty clear, but in order to see whether or not it's got good word economy, and, and by word economy, what I'm talking about is, is it using too many words or is it using an appropriate amount of words to communicate the idea? Um, I've broken down each sentence and set it up on its own line, and then in, beneath it in parentheses, we've placed essentially the meaning of the sentence, sort of the bare bones of the sentence. So the first sentence, walk into any office today and you know that things are not as they were a decade ago, is communicating that things have changed in the workplace. Ask employees about their coworkers, and many will say they're working on projects with colleagues in di a different building, a different city, or even a different country, is communicating that things have changed in the workplace in that we are no longer limited by distance. So things have changed, this is how. The business landscape has changed as globalization and technology have reshaped the way we conceptualize teamwork and conduct business. Basically means 
things have changed in the workplace regarding these specific things, teamwork and globalization, and uh, teamwork due to globalization and technology. And then finally, there are substantial changes in how teams are structured across the globe and therefore organizations must identify challenges inherent in leading a virtual workforce and then devise appropriate strategies to meet them. Basically means that due to globalization and technology, things have changed in the workplace regarding teamwork and businesses must address new problems related to a virtual workforce. So those are all the meanings and it kind of sounds redundant, right? And that's because if you look here, you can see that each sentence says something that the previous sentence says, but doesn't add a whole lot new to it. So things have changed. That's what the first is saying. And then the second is just saying sort of how they've changed. And then it's saying uh, in the third sentence, and you can see here um, that the different city or different country, again, biz the business landscape has changed. Globalization and technology. Well, globalization is related to the different countries and different cities, uh, the technology that's enabling that. Um, so all of these things are really kind of summarized in the following sentence. And so we can get rid of everything that's redundant and what we're left with is due to globalization and technology, things have changed in the workplace regarding teamwork and businesses must address new problems related to a virtual workforce, which is pretty clear but we can also sort of simplify that even further and say the internet has made global teamwork possible, but these virtual teams also pre present new problems that businesses must solve. Every time we revise this sentence, what we're doing is we're taking ideas that are presented using a lot of different words or sometimes whole phrases and replacing that with a single word. So instead of talking, uh, having a whole sentence about globalization and technology, we can just say the internet because that's exactly what that is. And that moves us from 98 words to 19 words, which is better word economy. I'm of the opinion that we haven't really lost any of the meaning here. Um, a few things might have been taken out, but I don't think they were uh, particularly relevant. So that's another thing about word economy. It's not just saying the same thing in fewer words. It's figuring out exactly what needs to be said and what doesn't. And either way, 19 words is much easier to wrap your head around the 98 words. If you look at this final sentence, the internet has made global teamwork possible, but these virtual teams also present new problems that businesses must solve. Well, that's easy to understand. That's simple. That first paragraph was so long and wordy that by the time you got to the end of it, I wasn't really sure what I was reading or what I was supposed to take away. What's the main idea? It had been lost on me. But when we simplify it, when we make it shorter, it becomes clearer. Next, let's talk about accuracy. And accuracy is just saying what you mean to say. Now, first of all, this is an issue of honesty. I'm not talking, or we're not going to talk here about political doublespeak, really, because that's something that is up to you as, as an individual. Do you want to be the kind of person who manipulates people by saying something you don't actually mean? and then relying on the technicality of your statement to maintain your status as an honest person. That's not what we're talking about. Of course, you ought to be an honest person. But more than that, you need to, to state what you want to say simply. You lose accuracy when you state something in, in a confusing way. Um, not only in terms of what you're actually saying, you might say it incorrectly, but the goal is communication. Your audience is probably going to understand it incorrectly if you aren't very accurate. So let's look at some examples from Politics in the English Language by George Orwell. So one of the things that he does, and I've reversed it here, is he takes something simple and makes it complicated. Let's read the complicated thing that he's created. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. Now, if you read something like this, your first reaction might be, uh, I'm not smart enough for this. Whoever wrote this must be really smart. And that's not true. Whoever wrote it is certainly uh, capable of writing something in a confusing way, but the meaning has really been lost here. Accuracy is not their goal. They want to, uh, accuracy of communication isn't that author's goal. They just want to sound smart. So I, I wouldn't imagine unless you read this essay by George Orwell that you would know what this is referring to. But this paragraph is actually just this scripture. I returned and saw under the sun. 
that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. So this is much clearer, and when this is read, there's accuracy. The It's communicated accurately, and so it can be understood accurately, because there's not all this extra fluff that throws, that throws the reader off. Uh, so he gives us a couple of rules in order to make sure that our communication, what we communicate is done accurately. Uh, and these are quoted, uh, these rules are quoted from the actual essay. And I apologize for missing the quotation marks here to close that off. Bit of a hurry with the move. Never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Never use a long word when a short one will do. If it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word. If you can think of an everyday English equivalent, and then finally break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous, and that's the general writing rule of rules are broken very often for the sake of art uh, in certain situations, so don't hold to the rule and ignore the art of writing. Finally, I want to look at uh, moving from the known to the unknown, and this comes. This idea was first introduced to me by a guy named Joseph Williams in his book Style. And what he basically means is that it's easier for people to understand something if they begin with if the sentence begins with something that they know, and if it starts with something they know, that creates a foundation on which you can then add something they don't know. So the beginning of the sentence should be familiar. The end of the sentence should be something unfamiliar which then makes that familiar. So that this process creates kind of a train of meaning. So I've written this paragraph and it's related to the paragraph we read earlier um, from that blogs uh, when they were trying to sell a book. It's related to that. This is a, a train of meaning I've created that communicates the same idea they were trying to uh, communicate. A virtual workforce helps increase productivity by connecting the best employees in the most efficient way. This efficiency isn't without cost though. The problems that arise from working over distance and in different time zones require new dynamic solutions. A few of these solutions, as well as guidelines for developing your own solutions, can be found in the chapters below. So they're trying to sell a book. This is how I would have introduced it, probably. And let's look at a visual of what's going on here, how we're moving from the known to the unknown. So the first thing I need to do is create something that's known. A virtual workforce helps increase productivity by connecting the best employees in the most efficient way. So now that we've introduced the idea of efficiency, using efficiency at the beginning of the next paragraph, or the next sentence, is a, a realm of known for our reader. So we move from efficiency then to cost, and cost being the rough equivalent of problems, we move from, again, that known of cost or problems onto new and dynamic solutions, which then becomes the known for the next sentence. So it creates this sort of train where each meaning is hooked up to the previous sentence. And that's, well, uh, when we talk about flow, if you hear someone say, oh, it needs to flow better, this is usually what they're talking about, but a more um, uh, tactile, I suppose, uh, way of thinking about it. This is, a, it has more teeth on it. This is uh, a more literal way of thinking about flow, is moving from the known to the unknown. So your sentences ought to do this. And then finally, on variance. Uh, this, uh, you need to make sure you vary the number of words in each sentence. If the number of words in each sentence is too close, it sounds boring. It creates a rhythm that can make it hard for your audience to listen. Your writing will sound dry and choppy, too, which makes it seem less professional. You have to be careful because it's easy to fall into this repetitive pattern. And you'll notice as I read it, it sounds repetitive because every sentence in that paragraph has exactly 14 words, which is infuriating. Um, if you've ever read something and it just seems choppy, or if uh, you find your mind wandering off in, in the middle of reading it, chances are you're reading sentences that have several, uh, that have close to or the exact number of words in a row. And a good paragraph ought to breathe. Longer sentences followed by shorter sentences, maybe another short sentence, and then a longer sentence. It needs to sort of inhale and exhale. And what that does is it stresses the reader's mind, it gives them a whole bunch of new information, and then it gives them space to relax. Simple ideas, concrete ideas, ideas that they can understand. 
And then after that, when you move into something longer, your reader's prepared because they've had a time to relax in those shorter sentences and they can handle the new meaning and the difficulty and, and the long-windedness of your particular sentence. To look at more about sentence variety, go to the Purdue OWL. Um, you can just Google Purdue OWL sentence variety and it'll bring it up or you can type in the URL there and they have a great post on sentence variety. So this has been an introduction to sentences. You'll also have a reading from the Writer's Hard Race Handbook, Section S, about uh, effective sentences. And while I think the, that, that reading is good and you ought to do it, it has more um, specific uh, advice on particular flaws in sentences. I would rather you, uh, while I want you to be aware of those, so do read, I would rather you focus more on just being um, attuned to these rules as you write and as you edit your own work. And when you've turned in, um, to, by tonight I hope when you've turned in your letters of appeal, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and we're going to look at sentences and we're going to close set it according to these guidelines and these principles to give you an idea of how they can affect your own work. Um, look out for more videos over the course of the coming week. I'll be traveling a lot tomorrow, but Following that, I'm going to be sending you videos related to um, uh, this week's chapter from uh, The Call to Write on, uh, oh, what is it? Memoirs. It's my favorite chapter that we, we do, actually. Uh, we'll be sending you a video on memoirs, uh, and you'll be working on your own memoir for the week after the fourth. I hope this has been helpful, and please feel free to contact me should you have any questions.